Today's video is sponsored by Shudder. Shudder is the world's premier streaming service for horror, thriller, and supernatural movies and series. You could call it the Netflix of horror. Their service boasts the world's largest, fastest growing human curated selection of chilling and suspenseful content. And as you'd expect, it's filled to the brim with original shows and exclusive titles which you can't find anywhere else. All streamable to your favourite devices, including iPhone, iPad, Apple TV, Android devices, pretty much whatever you use. So whether you're relaxing at home or you're out and about, you'll still have access to their huge treasure trove of original entertainment on just about every topic under the sun. You like psycho revenge stories? Check out their shocking series adaptation of Wolf Creek. Want to unsettle your in-laws this Christmas? They have a whole section titled Unhappy Holidays. With new content being added on a weekly basis, you're guaranteed to never run out of creepy content to binge. One newly released Shudder exclusive I recommend is Leap of Faith, a documentary that goes into detail about how the world's most infamous horror movie, The Exorcist, was developed and created, all told by the equally infamous director himself, William Friedkin. It's super interesting and eye-opening, and definitely one for anybody interested in horror movies or movie making. Fans of other classic and modern favourites won't be disappointed either. Just recently I got excited when I saw that Shudder had Audition, a must-see for fans of J-horror which I've been looking for on other services everywhere. With a low subscription price of just $5.99 a month or $56.99 a year, with Shudder it's never been easier to find something grotesquely engrossing to fuel your nightmares. To try Shudder free for 30 days, head over to Shudder.com and use promo code MASQUERADE and get started streaming the best horror, thriller and supernatural content, all completely ad-free. Again. That's S-H-U-D-D-E-R dot com, and use promo code MASQUERADE to start your free month of spookiness. So I usually don't cover otherworldly cases in my videos, but since I found a few hidden gems recently, I thought it might be fun to examine a few mysteries that have a sort of X-Files type vibe to them. I always try and stay away from outlandish mysteries, so I've only selected ones that have multiple witnesses, and that have been thoroughly scientifically analysed. Even so, they still remain unanswered. But that's not to say the truth isn't out there somewhere. With all that said, let's get into the first one. Let's take a trip in both geography and time, and examine a truly bizarre incident. Evora, Portugal, 2nd of November, 1959. From his headmaster's office at a local college, Dr. Guides do Amaral noticed something strange, just floating far off in the sky outside his window. It was a bright blue, cloudless day, and this seemingly metallic sphere that was just hovering in the sky was completely out of place. And then again, his old eyes weren't as sharp as they once were, so along with some other teachers, he set up a telescope in the courtyard and took a more magnified look at the thing. As he examined it, he could hardly believe what he was seeing. There, in the sky, was a whitish blue, shimmering object, moving in a completely unnatural way. It would hover in place for long periods, and then zip in a random direction at what Dr. Amaral described as a speed that defied the laws of physics. He knew this definitely wasn't a bird or a plane. It had no wings or propellers to speak of, just a metallic orb suspended in space. As they were observing it, it vanished into thin air. Then, without warning, and seemingly out of nowhere, another, much larger flying object appeared above them. It was physically similar to the first, apart from the fact that it was several times bigger and comprised of two spheres instead of one. The top sphere was solid, but the one beneath it moved in a wavy, jellyfish-like motion. This one too would just hover in place before moving at a ridiculously quick pace somewhere else. Occasionally it dropped altitude, only to shoot back up into the sky at record-breaking speed, going so high as to almost disappear from their view. Dr. Amaral asked his nearby co-workers and students to look through his telescope and confirm that he wasn't going senile. Much like him, they too couldn't believe their eyes, nor could the hundreds of other witnesses across town who also saw the oscillating object above them. After approximately 30 minutes of loitering, the unidentified flying object silently sped off and disappeared. The astonishment of the town's residents soon turned to unease when a strange, cobweb-like substance started falling from the sky down upon them. Long strands of this white, stringy material rained down and formed in large clumps on the ground and rooftops. This still unidentified substance would later become known as angel hair rain. 
Dr. Amaral and his students examine the falling angel hair. At first, they theorize that it must be the work of some breed of flying spider dropping silky webs from above. Such things are exceptionally common in Australia and New Zealand, though admittedly very rare in Europe. Still, that didn't seem to make much sense. There's no way a whole army of spiders could have produced this much webbing, and there weren't any pesky arachnids visible anywhere. Dr. Amaral and his students tried to pick up some of the strange substance, only to realize that the hairs melted in their warm hands. During the four hours that it fell over the small provincial town, Dr. Amaral was able to scoop up a small clump of the white filaments into a petri dish. 62 miles away, a team of fighter pilots were preparing for takeoff at Portugal's Sintra Air Base. Several of the pilots, including Captain Tomás Silva, noticed a strange, slimy substance forming on their canopies. It was the same white filaments that were falling over Avora, collecting on their jets like snow in winter. After washing off the substance and finishing their mission, Captain Tomás Silva called his father, Admiral Concisawa Silva, an enthusiastic amateur physicist and astronomer, and asked him for his opinion on what the substance could be. Stumped, Admiral Silver himself called up his friend in Avora. That friend just so happened to be Dr. Amaral. Amaral said that the same substance had just fallen over his town too. They realized this must be a nationwide incident, and when Amaral said that he had successfully collected a sample, the two scientists quickly agreed to meet and examine it together. After magnifying the angel hair 120 times, both Amaral and Silver noticed something bizarre. There was a living organism under their microscope. On the hair was a one millimeter wide, yellow, unicellular creature with ten slime-covered tentacles that expanded and moved. The thing's legs were so strong that they could actually lift up the slides that the creature was framed between slightly. It demonstrated defensive mechanisms like that of an animal. Neither of them had ever seen anything like this before in their professional careers. The only known animals to have a similar structure to the microscopic creature were certain types of jellyfish. Okay, so maybe this was some type of rare jellyfish from the deep ocean, but that doesn't explain how so many of them started falling from the sky on stringy cobwebs. Some scientists warily started speculating that the creatures could have come from a neighboring planet or from Earth's extra atmospheric space. Others believed that the hair-like strands were vaporized meteor fragments. Given the time period, some speculated that this had something to do with a Cold War gas test. Again, given the time period, the Portuguese government was extremely authoritarian and nationalistic. The doctor's research was deemed to be against God, and any effort to publish his findings were thwarted. Dr. Amaral tried to translate his research and publish it internationally, but when he tried to do so, he was threatened with suspension. Both he and Admiral Silva were publicly shamed to the point where they both gave up trying to get others on board with their discovery. Unable to proceed with his research and feeling out of his depth, Dr. Amaral handed over the preserved specimens to the University of Lisbon, where they were further analysed. Still, Amaral himself never gave up looking into the angel hair and organism, and when he passed away in the 1990s, he left behind his large amount of research. He collected hundreds of testimonials from other people who had seen the flying objects that morning in November, and in each case, the witnesses said that their sightings were followed by angel hair falling from the sky. He had also learned that this so-called angel hair rain had been observed at several other points in history. 1561 in Germany, 1917 again in Portugal, 1898 in Montgomery, USA, 1952 in France, and 1954 in Italy. Still, it's unclear whether those incidents were the exact same as this. In 2008, an expert cell biologist was contacted to examine Dr. Amaral's photos of the unknown creature found on the webs. The expert wrote, This structure, or microorganism as some have called it, is still unknown to contemporary science. I was unable to identify a single structure akin to an earthly single-cell organism. So, there we have it. Surely the fact that the angel hair coincided with the appearance of the flying objects couldn't have been a coincidence. Then again, could there be a far more rational explanation for this mystery than just aliens? Of course. Like many scientists have noted, the structure of the creatures on the hair is extremely similar to young, microscopic jellyfish. How they came to fall from the sky is anyone's guess though. Perhaps they were scooped up in a whirlwind. 
still. That doesn't account for the flying objects themselves, which were seen by hundreds of people just before the hair fell. Were they military in origin? Civilian? Or something more otherworldly? Sadly, we may never hear more from this case, due to the sad fact that the labs at the University of Lisbon burned down in the late 1970s, taking the original samples Dr. Amaral had collected with them. The only other sample that may exist was taken by a group of independent researchers, and has since mysteriously vanished. A huge shout out to Reddit user LucyCat writes for their amazing overview of this case on the Unresolved Mysteries subreddit. Link to that write-up in the bio. Now, on to number two. So that first case was weird, sure, but this is where things get dark. Now I'm sure most of you are familiar with the Dyatlov Pass incident, a favourite of horror fans on YouTube. What you may not have heard though, is the equally disturbing and still unexplained Hamar Daban Pass incident, sometimes called the Buryatia Dyatlov Pass. On August 5th, 1993, a team of mountaineers were trekking through the Hamar Daban mountain range in Siberia. The expedition was made up of seven people, and was headed by Ludmila Korovina, a seasoned hiker with tons of experience. Joining her were 24-year-old Tatiana Filipenko, Denis Vachin, Vika Zalasova, Timur Bapanov, Valia Utachenko, and 23-year-old Sasha Krisin, who Ludmila had effectively raised and thought of as her own son. The young group set off on the morning of the 2nd, as did several other hiking groups in the area. Unfortunately, Although good weather was predicted, the team were blasted with freezing cold rain and snow. This didn't dissuade them from continuing, however. Like I said, the group was young and eager to prove themselves to Ludmilla, whom they all looked up to. Ludmilla didn't go easy on them either, and along the way made some questionable decisions. On the night of the 4th, for instance, she had the group set up their camp on a slope about 4 kilometers away from the nearest forest. There was a thunderstorm raging that night, and this area was completely unprotected from the elements. Given her mountains of experience in, well, mountaineering, you'd have thought she would have chosen to camp elsewhere. The next morning, it happened. As the group packed up their things and descended down the mountain, Sasha suddenly began bleeding heavily from his nose, ears and mouth. He fell to the ground, and was dead within moments. This happened so suddenly that everyone else was left dumbfounded. Sasha was strong, healthy, and hadn't complained of any pain up until that moment. What had just happened? Most distraught was Ludmilla herself. Like I said, Sasha was like a son to her. She ordered everyone else down the mountain while she stayed with the body. They followed her instruction and started walking. No more than a minute later, however, they heard Ludmilla shouting to them for help, saying that she couldn't move. They rushed back to see what was wrong with her only to find their leader sprawled out on the ground beside Sasha, blood gushing out of her face. The rest of the group were horrified. Two of their team, who were apparently healthy that morning, had just perished in front of them in the blink of an eye. They started to panic, terrified that the same thing was about to happen to them. Well, it did. Valia Utochenko, the group's only survivor, explained what happened next. Moments after discovering Ludmilla's body, Timur and Vika began tearing at their clothes, fell to the ground, and started twitching and foaming from the mouth. In Valia's words, Dennis began to hide behind the rocks and run away. Tatiana was banging her head against the stones. Vika and Timur probably went mad. Valia tried to help Vika, the youngest female in the group, but when she did, the girl bit her. Dennis and Valia were the only two group members still unaffected by whatever was happening. They both began to run at full speed down the mountain. Dennis told Valia to take out the essential items from her bag, abandon the rest, and run as fast as she could. She started rifling through her belongings, but by the time she looked back up at Dennis, he was lying on the ground, bleeding from every orifice. Alone and terrified, she sprinted off. Now, without any provisions and still far from civilization, she was forced to sleep alone in the forest at the bottom of the mountain all through the freezing night. The next morning, Valia made her way back up the slope to look for survivors, and came upon a scene of pure carnage. All of her young co-hikers were dead. For three days, the 17-year-old wandered through the mountain pass alone in hopes of being rescued. 
She tried following electric cables, but they only led her to an abandoned village. Her mind had been shattered by what she had witnessed. Eventually, she made it back to civilization, but at first was too traumatized to tell anyone what had happened. Still, when she came back alone, a search and rescue operation was immediately launched for the other group members. Their bodies wouldn't be found for another month, by which point animals had already started devouring them. What the rescuers could tell was that the figures in the snow were contorted, and their faces were twisted in pain. It was a scary picture, said one of the rescue team. The hikers were lying on a small ledge, some huddled together, some a little distance away. They had no eyes. In the empty sockets and parted mouths, worms were crawling. We packed the bodies in plastic bags. When they flew to Ulanude, the smell in the helicopter was impossible. Some of the men were sick. To this day, we still don't know what strange phenomenon claimed the lives of six of those seven hikers. Autopsies confirm that they were all otherwise healthy, though there was bruising in all of their lungs. Could this have all been the result of some strange sickness? Some sort of poisoning? Hypothermia, perhaps? Or did they stumble into a secret test site for nerve agents? What's strange is that there were numerous other hiking groups in the same area, yet none of them were affected by whatever killed Valia's group. There's a lot of debate online about this, but as of right now, no definitive conclusion. The disappearance of Fred Valentich is a case that has long been shrouded in mystery. Fred was a 20-year-old Australian pilot who went missing back in 1978 during a training flight to King Island over Bass Strait. At 7.06pm on October 21st, he radioed air traffic control, telling them that another unidentified aircraft was flying about 300 meters above his, and that it appeared to be following him. Strange, they replied. There wasn't supposed to be any traffic at that altitude. Fred told them that he thought this other pilot was toying with him, racing off and approaching at high speed, and then, quote-unquote, orbiting above him. He also said that he was starting to have engine problems. One thing Fred could make out was that this other aircraft was very large, had a metallic surface, and was illuminated by four bright green lights on its underside. Air traffic control then asked him to identify what type of aircraft it was. Fred paused before replying. It's not an aircraft. Immediately after that, his transmission was interrupted by a strange metallic noise, and then cut out completely. Despite an extensive search and rescue effort, neither Fred nor his Cessna 182L light aircraft were ever seen again. Needless to say, there are a number of theories about what happened to Fred during that fateful night. Of course, I'll start by stating the obvious. Some people are convinced that he encountered a UFO which either took down his plane or abducted it. They cite the strangeness of Fred's radio messages, the fact that this other aircraft apparently had green lights, that Fred and his aircraft were never found, and that other UFO sightings were reported in Melbourne that very night he vanished. That being said, more skeptical minds have proposed a few other theories. Some believe that Fred, having gained a reputation as a bit of a careless pilot, was the maker of his own undoing. In the past, he had received a warning for straying into a controlled zone in Sydney, and had twice got in trouble for intentionally flying into clouds. As such, they say that Fred must have accidentally been flying upside down without realizing it, something that's far more common than you'd imagine. The aircraft and lights he was seeing could have easily been his own, reflecting off the water's surface below him. After a while, they say that he simply collided with the ocean and met with a watery end. As compelling as that theory sounds, others have countered by pointing out that his model of plane had a gravity-fed engine, and flying upside down would have resulted in immediate engine failure. He wouldn't have been able to contact air traffic control at all. Others think that Fred had planned his whole disappearance from the start, and that he's still alive and well somewhere. The guy was a known UFO enthusiast, and, according to his own father, the young pilot constantly worried that aliens were going to attack the Earth. Certainly sounds like the type of guy who'd get a kick out of setting up an elaborate hoax. Backing up that theory is the fact that a light aircraft mysteriously landed not far from Cape Otway, just around the same time that Fred went missing. Could the young pilot have staged the whole incident? 
Finally, pilot James McGaha and author Joe Nickel have suggested that Red was the victim of his own inexperience, and that he sent himself into a so-called graveyard spiral after misreading the horizon. Since human senses are adapted for land, it's extremely risky to fly an aircraft without computer-navigated systems. Our brains create a lot of misleading sensory illusions due to being unable to accurately interpret and reflect the movement of the plane. Simply put, they say his senses lied to him and convinced him to fly in a downward spiral. Ultimately, we just don't know what happened to Fred and his airplane back in 1978. Was it aliens? Well, that's the most fun answer of the bunch, sure. Though, as you just heard, there are several far more grounded explanations. Though, since neither Frederick nor his plane's wreckage have ever been recovered, his case is likely to remain one that's cited by other UFO enthusiasts for the foreseeable future. Whatever did happen to him, I'm sure that's what he would have wanted. Just a quick little one to end things. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with it, but it fits nicely into this video. The WOW signal is the name given to the most convincing piece of evidence we have for intelligent alien life. On August 15th, 1977, at 10.16pm, Ohio State University's Big Ear radio telescope picked up a narrowband radio signal. What made this signal so strange and unexpected was that it came from the direction of the Sagittarius star constellation and had all the characteristics of being extraterrestrial in origin. The signal got its name after Jerry Emmon, the scientist who discovered the radio anomaly, circled his finding on the computer printout and wrote WOW next to it. Since the WOW event occurred, multiple leading scientists have tried to come up with explanations for the signal's existence. The thing is, none of them have been widely accepted in the scientific community. Jerry Emmon himself said that it may have been made after a signal from Earth bounced off a piece of floating space debris and was reflected back towards Big Ear. That was later concluded to be very unlikely. All other attempts to refute the evidence that the signal came from somewhere else other than Earth have fallen flat. Needless to say, there have been many attempts by other astrological institutions with more advanced radio telescopes to find and identify the signal, but the WOW signal has never been observed since, nor have any other signals like it. Since then, the WOW signal has been referenced in numerous songs, commercials, games and TV shows, including, as the title of this video suggests, The X-Files. Its origin remains a complete mystery. And, given how much research has gone into it over the years, it's easily the strongest candidate for an alien radio transmission that's ever been detected. Maybe we're not alone after all. Hey guys, Lazy here, and thank you very much for listening. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. It's something a little different from what I usually put out, so let me know what you thought down in the comments. Anyway, uh, over on my Discord we had this 12 Days of Christmas contest, so I wanted to showcase a few of the winners here, along with a few runners-up. A big thank you to everyone who participated, and if you too would like to join the Lazy Legion Discord server, you can find the link down in the bio. Also, a massive thank you to all of my supporters here on YouTube and over on Patreon especially my biggest supporters. Phantom Knight, Hamish K, Amanda Hansen, Decaying Girl, Tom King, The Only Dorita, The Lecky, Sloane Crawford, Sarah Ramirez, Ricky Cohen Jr., Procupidine Natter, Nadine, Philip Westra, Monica Mendoza, Leonardo Martinez, Lord 210, Infamous Sempapi, Hungry and Hammered, Gina Valera, Expand On, Crawford K. McDonald, Connor Lothan, Charlie Lackey, Azrael Warakai, Aura Dragon One, Anime Wim, and Alex Greensall. Thank you all so much for your continued support, it really helps the channel out. That about wraps things up for this one guys, be sure to smash that like button or I'll smash you, and you'll be hearing from me again very, very soon. Until then, you all stay spooky. And remember, the best things happen in the dark.